All righty, so today we're, today we're gonna talk about transitioning from college to work. And we're partnering with Career Services. So um, Eileen Walsh is here from Career Services today. So if, uh, Eileen, do you just wanna say hi and tell us about yourself? My video won't start. Sorry about that. Uh oh, oh, you can see you now. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Eileen Walsh. I'm with Career Services. I'm a Career Services Advisor. I work on the Center Tech campus, and um, we're here to help you all the way along the line. So anybody that needs us, just come and say hello, and you can make an appointment either through Navigator by emailing any of us. Great, thank you. So we're gonna get started. And first we'll be talking about uh, the financial aid loan repayment aspect of once you're graduating and get it ready to get the big job out in the real world. So once you have graduated, you're gonna to wanna to go to studentaid.gov to complete your exit canceling requirement. So that is kind of another tutorial, like when you did your entrance counseling, they'll let you know what to do about your loans. This is what to do with your loans after you graduate and have to start repaying on them. So you would go to studentaid.gov and sign in with your FAFSA ID and password, and then tell them why you're completing your exit counseling. So you're gonna click on the little person here with the graduation hat and say that I'm graduating or recently graduated from one or more of the schools I list, listed on my FAFSA. So you'll go through the course and then I'll tell you everything about setting up your loan repayment plan and updating your current contact information, which is always important to do. So, you know, over the time that you're paying off your loans, which could be for 10 to 20 years, I know that sounds scary, but uh, make sure that they always have your up-to-date contact information in case you move or anything changes. Okay, so understanding your federal student loan obligation. So this means that repaying your student loan is required, even if you don't complete your program. You didn't complete the program within the regular time for program completion. You aren't able to obtain employment upon graduation from your program, or if for some reason you're dissatisfied with or didn't receive the expected education from the school. So what happens during the grace period? So the grace period is when you finish or leave school, you'll enter the six months grace period. So a student loan grace period is a stretch of time after you've graduated when you're not required to make payments. But this would be the time that you go in and set up your repayment plan and get everything ready to go, like setting up an automatic debit out of your bank account. So once you go to studentaid.gov, you'll be able to see who your lender is and you could give them a call and go through all the repayment plan options and decide which is gonna be best for you. Also, if you graduated from CCA, but you decide you wanna come back for another degree or certificate, or maybe go get your bachelor's degree at a four-year university, you'll need to um, let your lender servicer know that you're going back and resuming enrollment on at least a half-time basis. So your six months grace period could either end or be on hold. So what they'll do is they'll put you back into an in-school status or deferment. And then once you finish with that degree, then you'll have another full six months grace period 
and then um, you'll be able to start making your repayments then. Any questions on grace period? Okay. So now let's talk about the impact interest has on your loans. So this is the interest you're responsible for repaying and it depends on the type of student loan that you have. So most people take out a direct subsidized loan because that's the one that you get the better break on. Um, you don't have to pay interest until after you graduate, but it accumulates after the grace period has ended when the repayment period has started. So if you lost your subsidy because you've taken longer than 150% of time to complete your program, the interest will begin accruing while you're in school and in grace. So keep that in mind. And then also, if you have a direct unsubsidized loan, this is the one that your interest accrues immediately from the day the funds are dispersed, which we, in other words, make available to your school. And when you're in school during the grace period and in repayment. So frequently asked questions about interest is can I lower my interest rate? Which is no, um, it's a fixed rate that you receive once you take out the loan. So depending on whatever the interest rate is as of 7-1, whatever year, because it changes yearly on July 1st, whatever that interest rate is, when you take out the loan, that's what you'll be locked into for the life of your loan. Now, the only other way to maybe lower it is looking into a loan consolidation where you could get maybe a little better break on an interest rate. So how is the interest rate set? So like I said, it's um, set annually by a statute with the federal government every July 1st. And the interest is fixed for the life of the loan. And you can save on interest by making payments when they're not required and keeping interest from accruing. So when you're transitioning from college to the workforce, brings on new responsibilities and opportunities. So your degree may help you land a job that provides more financial freedom than you ever had as a student. But on the other hand, your paycheck may not stretch quite as far as you expected, especially if you're managing education, loan repayment, credit card debt, or both. But no matter what your financial outlook is now, understanding the concept of financial health is an important step. So here are five steps to financial health. One is earning. So after college, the first step to financial health is to earn more money than you spend. This will give you more opportunities to save including saving interest charges by repaying your student loans more quickly. Then there's spending. So how you spend money is more important than how much you earn. Oops. oops. So maintaining a monthly spending plan will help you spend money on your financial goals and not things that don't matter. Also, saving and investing so even if you have a college-related debt, it still makes sense to start an emergency to avoid financial setbacks from things like unexpected dental or card bills. And then there's borrowing. So even though you borrowed loans for your education, they are considered smart loans because you're investing in your lifelong career path. Other loans like for buying a car with, will add to your debt and take away more money than from your account. So seriously think about taking on a new loan or if that money can be applied to your student loan payments instead. And then there's always protecting. Make sure you have health and other types of insurance to protect you from paying high dollar expenses, which could lead to financial failure. Are there any other questions now?
Okay, so we're gonna move on. Okay, so we're going to watch a video presented by Erica Hines. She wasn't able to join us today, so she pre-recorded um, the video for us. So let me just stop sharing the screen and we'll bring up her, her video. So hang on one sec. Alrighty, here we go. Hello, my name is Erica Hines and I am with Career Service here to talk now about salary negotiation strategies. So according to Indeed, over 70% of hiring managers actually expect candidates to negotiate their salary or benefits. That might be coming as a shock to a lot of people, but yeah, 70% of hiring managers expect their candidates to negotiate their salary or benefits. And so there's some important things there that we want to be able to unpack. But in this portion of the presentation, we're going to talk about why it's so important to negotiate as well as strategies and some steps for when you are preparing to negotiate as well as that actual negotiation process that you're entering into. So first off, why is the negotiation important? Well, as the previous slide said, 70% of employers expect it. And so that means that there's likely room for you to be negotiating for a higher salary or better benefits for yourself. Once you have an offer, you kind of have a little bit more power in that negotiation process. And so being able to negotiate smartly and being able to strategize how you want to negotiate can really set you up for that financial success later on in life. So a couple of points that we have here are that being able to negotiate for a higher salary upon your start of a position means that you have an opportunity for larger raises as you progress in that role. Most raises are based on a percentage of what your base salary is. So if you're making, just to make it easy, $10,000 a year and the raise opportunity is 5%, then that's a $500 raise that you might get that next year. However, if you go into a job making $20,000 a year, still getting that 5% raise, that 5% raise on $20,000 is $1,000 versus the $500 on a 10,000 raise. So that's one of the key reasons why it's important to negotiate if possible for a higher salary as you're starting out in a position. Companies also often have a range that they're willing to provide, right? So again, a lot of employers are expecting that negotiation process to happen anyways. And so oftentimes they'll build in a little bit of a buffer into their salary range of what they're actually offering you. And so it is common, depending on the industry, to negotiate five, 10, even more um, in salary that you wanna be able to be paid. And so we'll talk about how do you decide how much more to ask for, um, as well as how to bring that up. And then another good reason for negotiation is that there is still a gender pay gap in the United States. In 2020, women earned 81 cents for every dollar a man earned, even while holding the same position as men. So that's an important factor for our 
women on the call or who are listening, as well as our people of color, um, just to be aware of that. I'm sorry, um, Renee you said you couldn't hear. Maybe it's because I muted myself. Let me know. Yeah, if you can... when you muted, it stopped. Okay, so here we go. Sorry about that. Thank you. So, the steps for salary negotiation we have do your research, additional considerations when negotiating, knowing what your expectations are, practicing your communication plan, and getting it in writing. These are the steps that are going to be the most useful for you as you are planning out that conversation and as you are preparing to accept an offer. So research. Your research, research should start early on in your job search process. You should start to get an idea of what is the industry standard for how much these types of positions are being paid. If you are doing a job search, like many of us are when we're preparing to graduate, then you're going to see a lot of positions out there. And it's important to just take note of what are those uh, positions willing to pay? What are they starting at? What do the job descriptions say that those um, pieces of the job are looking like for you? And you can start to kind of compile some information to try to get a good idea of kind of what is that standard. So that way, if you are interviewing for a position, you already have an idea of, is this uh, company likely to pay a little bit higher or lower than the other companies that I've been looking at? So that's a good place to start. And there are also online resources that can also be useful for you. Places like Glassdoor or Career One Stop that give information on one specific companies, Glassdoor provides information based on people who have actually worked at that company and the feedback that they have given. And so it's great because it gives that kind of real feedback of what's going on in that company. And because it is a voluntary um, source of information, it might not have all the pieces of the picture there. So it is possible that you might be looking at salaries on Glassdoor, but you won't find the exact salary for the type of position that you are applying for. And so just kind of keeping an idea there. However, Career One Stop shows the average of the job title that you are looking for based on the national average the state average, as well as your local city average for that kind of position. And so that one is also a really useful um, resource for you to just get a base pay. And what Career One Stop does is it'll show you kind of what is the full range, what is the um, low end of that scale, what is the average or the mean, uh, median of the pay range for that position, or what is kind of the higher side. And so something to keep in mind is that as you are entering into the job market for your industry for the first time, it's likely that you're going to be making a little bit less money, right? It's your first job. You don't have a whole lot of experience yet. However, you can still negotiate for a little bit higher. And especially as you gain more experience, it's important to be able to negotiate as you progress into your career. And so just keep that in mind that when you first start, you might not be in that mid to high range for a position. You might still be in that kind of low to mid range. And that's OK, but it's still important for you to feel comfortable with what you're making and be able to still have those negotiation skills because you never know. You could still get more money as you start out. All right, so other important things to consider when you are negotiating. One, most of us negotiate because it's nice to have more money, right? That's the primary thought that people have is, am I going to be able to pay my bills and survive off of 
the um, salary that is being offered here. A couple of things in addition to that are to think of where is the position? What is the geographic location of that position? If you are thinking that you might want to move out of your current area, you want to look at the cost of living of that area because it might be higher or it might be lower. And that is going to affect how much you're making, right? If you're living in a place like Texas where the cost of living is a little bit lower than Colorado, their salaries are also going to be a little bit lower. Whereas Denver metro area, we all know is kind of rising and popular and it's a little bit expensive to live in right now. And so um, positions in the Denver area are typically going to pay a little bit higher than what they would in places like Texas or even places like our more rural areas of Colorado. And so th those are just important things for you to know about. If you're not sure what the cost of living is in a geographic location, if you're looking to move or get out of your current area, then a good thing that you can do is just Google cost of living in and type in that city. And that'll give you an idea of kind of what is the base. And you can also compare that to your current area to kind of know what is the difference between what I'm currently dealing with versus what I might be dealing with. You also want to think about, are there going to be moving expenses associated with the position? And so um, if, again, you're planning to move out of state, move across country, um, move across state to take a new position, you might want to be thinking about, are there any um, benefits or supplemental income that can be provided to help you with your moving expenses? Uh, many companies, if they know that you're moving across the country, are willing, excuse me, willing to pay a um, moving expense for you. Um, and so they'll actually give you an allotted um, amount that you can use to take care of things like your moving, um, packing, uh, a U-Haul, all of that kind of stuff can go towards that moving expense. Again, you want to think about how much experience you already have in this work. When you're starting out, you might not have a whole lot of experience, but it's still important for you to be able to show this is the experience that I've gained in my classwork. These are my um, examples, as you probably learned in my interviews. Um, I have done this, this, and this, and those have added to the experience that I already have. I'm excellent at being able to communicate strongly, or I'm excellent at organization and being able to plan out my projects and meet deadlines. If you have evidence of that kind of experience that's critical to your position, then being able to keep that in your mind while you're planning for that negotiation is going to be critical because it's showing that evidence behind why you deserve a higher salary. And then any additional skills, additional licenses or certifications that you have that might make you stand out in the field. Um, for anyone who might be a career changer, if you have skills that are in a different industry that are going to be useful for you and that are going to make you unique from people who are coming into this position traditionally straight out of school, then that might be a piece that is important for you to negotiate based on is that you're able to bring in a more um, diverse perspective into that workspace. Um, whereas if you are newer into the industry, but you have gotten a couple of different certifications that have kind of well-rounded and rounded out your skills, that might also be a point that you can negotiate for. And now we're going to talk about something that's not often thought about, but negotiation can be more than money. It doesn't just have to be your salary, your moving expenses, um, bonuses, things like that. Your negotiation can also include like benefits or insurance, being able to work remotely or have a flexible work schedule. That's something that's really big right now, right? Because we all have a lot of technology and knowledge and awareness that remote work can work in a lot of different environments. And so being able to negotiate for the things that are non-monetary that would still make your life easier, um, can be other things that you can consider while you're thinking about um, your negotiation process, right? If there is a certain schedule,
that you need to be able to work because you have kids or you need to be able to take your lunch at a different time. Being able to negotiate for those kinds of things are important. Um, also thinking about if you're able to get a work, a flexible work schedule, then is the higher salary necessary? Because if you think about that, you're then saving time, you're saving gas, you're saving a lot of, uh, of additional resources and being able to work from home versus having to drive into work every day or take public transportation into work every day. And so those are things that you also might want to think about if they're not able to increase your salary. Are there other things that might make up for that for you? All right. So after you've done your research, after you have thought about what are all of the potentials of the different kinds of uh, negotiation that you might do, it's important to step back and get an idea for what your own expectations are. You typically want to start that negotiation process once you receive an offer. But knowing your expectations, you probably want to get that before you're getting that offer. So as you are interviewing as you are learning about them and also allowing them to learn about you, you want to start thinking about, okay, what are my expectations for myself in this kind of position now that I know more about what the role is, now that I know what the expectations of the position are, what are my expectations as far as a salary, as far as benefits, as far as the hours that I'm working or anything else that was that would be important for you while you're thinking about going to work. Those are all things that you wanna to start to take into account and really formulate a plan of, okay, if I have this, this, and this, those are my deal breakers. These are the things that I have to have. I have to be able to pay my bills. I have to be able to um, say, go be able to take care of a parent at a certain time each day, or I have to be able to, um, have medical insurance, health insurance. Those kinds of things are things that might be your deal breakers. And then there might be a list of your nice to haves. So if you're able to get that a little bit of additional salary so that you can um, plan for vacations or put a little bit more in savings um, so that you can do things that you want to do, um, then that might be your nice to have box or um, that remote work. For some people that might be a non-negotiable, but for some that might be a nice to have. And so just knowing what are those expectations? What are the things that you have to have that cannot be um, missing from your uh, salary and benefits packet versus what are the things that they could be missing as long as um, your essential things are met? So, Again, you want to begin the actual negotiation process once you've received the job offer. This is, again, when you have some power in that um, application process. Once you have a offer of, hey, we want to work for you, this is what we're willing to offer, that's when you um, then know they already want you. And so now we want to start that process of figuring out, okay, so they want me in this position what are they willing to do to ensure that I am able to be successful in this role? So a good technique that I like to use right away is holding off on setting a number on salary as long as possible until you have that offer. Some companies in an early on interview will ask you, what are your salary expectations? And so a good response to that especially as you're still gathering information, you're still learning about the company so that you can even know what your expectations are, are to say something along the lines of, hey, I'm really excited about this conversation, but I'd like to hold off on setting an actual number until we've gotten an opportunity to know each other better, for me to know the role better and the expectations better, and then I would be happy to talk more about specifics. However, I know that the average for this type of position in the Denver area or in the Aurora area is this. And again, you can pull that from um, the resources that we've talked about in the previous slides. 
And it's also important to know your worth, the value of the work that you're doing for the company. Going back to the last slide, we talked about how it's important to know how the skills that you're bringing, how the certifications, how the knowledge experiences that you have are going to be useful for you in your position. And the same is um, important for knowing your expectations, knowing your worth. Um, it is okay to reject an offer if it is not meeting those non uh, negotiables for you, even after um, negotiating. It's okay to um, go through the process, try to negotiate, and if they're not able to meet your needs, they're not able to meet your needs. You don't have to accept a position. It is okay to reject that position. And another really good strategy to use early on in that process is once you get the offer, thank them for the opportunity and ask if you can have a day or two to think about the offer so that you can fine tune your research, fine tune your expectations, all of that kind of stuff. So that way you have a solid plan for when you go into that discussion for the negotiation. So that leads us into practicing your communication skills. It's always important to begin with gratitude have gratitude throughout the negotiation process and end with gratitude whether or not you decide that you want to accept the opportunity so um you get a call or you get an email and they say hey erica we would love to offer you this position um here's the salary here's a little bit about the benefits we'd love you to be a part of our team the first thing that should be out of your mouth is thank you so much for this opportunity that is great to hear and then asking for that time so you can think about it. So um, again, we wanna make sure that we have everything nice and in line and that we have our notes ready for when we actually enter into that negotiation conversation. So after that, thanks. You wanna then ask if you can take some time to think about it and then ask to schedule a time to follow up. Can we um, set up a time to talk over the phone or can we set up a time for Zoom maybe? Can I come in to talk with you um, in a couple of days so that we can um, kind of go through this process? And that will set you up so that you have that face-to-face -face or that back and forth conversation that allows for the actual conversation rather than trying to settle everything via an email or a message system. Okay, so that's that first conversation. Thank you for the opportunity. Can I have some time? Let's set a time so that we can talk in a couple of dates. Okay, then you want to start going back through all of your notes. Again, go back to the research, double check your research, go back to um, the skills that you have, the things that are gonna set you up for success in this kind of a position. And what are the things that are negotiables? What are the things that are non-negotiables, those nice to have things um, versus the things that you have to have. So have that all written out in a um, notepad or in a journal or somewhere that you're able to keep track of it. It's normal to feel stressful. And you know that because you've already been interviewing, right? That whole interviewing process is stressful and negotiation can also be stressful. And so we wanna make sure that we have our notes in place so that we don't miss any of those important pieces that we wanna make sure that we touch on. Some other things that you might include in your notes include um, being able to talk through what are the expectations of the position again, as far as the schedule, um, what they're offering for your benefits, so that you have a clear picture of what all of that is going to look like. Um, the salary, the pay schedule is also important for you to know um, for your own planning, if that's going to be a um, monthly pay cycle or twice a month, every two weeks, what does that look like? So that's all important things that you probably want to know about as you're starting that discussion. And then you want to practice actually saying out loud the things that are in your notes and practice asking the questions that you're planning on asking. It's one thing, as we all know, to have something planned out in our head. And it's completely different to actually be saying the words and vocalizing that. And so as many times as you can practice it, whether that is recording yourself on a video or talking to yourself in the mirror 
or even better if you have a friend or family member family member or a peer that you can practice with then that's even better because they can also give you feedback on what this process is looking like to them as an outsider so some skills for that communication piece is being assertive in your communication you want to make sure that you're confident in yourself and what you're asking for um, there's a big difference in just how you say things um, and so being able to say hi thank you very much for this opportunity i'd like to learn more about this and this and then following that up with is there any room for negotiation for this sounds a lot better than well i was maybe wondering if it might be possible that we might be able to look at this but like it's okay if not um you want to be assertive you want to be able to be in that role of these are what my needs are this is what I would like to be able to accomplish. Here's why I think that my skills are going to be really useful um, in this position. And so I believe that a salary of this is going to promote my success. Or I believe that my skills of this, this, and this are going to allow me to do this work. And so that's why I would appreciate being able to work from home two days a week, or I would appreciate um, having a transportation um, service, whether that is, I would like it if you could pay for my bus pass because I don't have uh, my own car, or if you um, have any resources for transportation, or if you have resources for childcare, those kinds of things are all things that you wanna be able to say and say assertively. Um, so speaking clearly, speaking calmly, being able to make eye contact if it's a face-to-face -face type of conversation, and being able to, again, present the data, present that information that you've already been collecting. And asking questions. Asking questions is important, whether or not um, you are having any resistance. It's good to ask questions just so that you get a bigger, um, better, more clear idea of what the um, work environment is going to look like. And if there is any resistance, that's even more important for asking any questions. If you say, is there any room for a negotiation for a salary? And they ask you, well, what are you thinking? And you put your salary idea out there and they come back with, well, I'm not sure if we can get up that high then ask a follow-up question. What information do you need for me to make that decision? Is there anything that I can do um, to show you that this is a salary that would be reasonable for me? Um, if I perform well in my first 60, 90, or 100 day, 128 days of the job, will there be opportunities to adjust my salary further? Um, if Again, if salary is not something that they can negotiate with you, if that's something that is set, um, sometimes government jobs um, are very strict or set in their salary or nonprofit jobs don't have a lot of budget for salary, then being able to ask what are the other negotiables available besides salary that we could discuss. So that might be the things like, well, we have on-site childcare, or well, we have really good health benefits, we have a really good um, vacation package, and being able to see, okay, might any of those pieces be useful for me? or I'm going to have to move for this position, is there any way that I can get a stipend for my moving expenses? Those are all things that you wanna be able to ask those questions for. And last but very importantly, closing the negotiation. Again, whether or not you're accepting the position, you wanna thank them for their time. Thank them for the offer, thank them for um, being able to connect with you and communicate with you throughout this process, and then accept or decline. Now, if you are accepting, you want to make sure that you get the agreed upon terms in writing. Nothing is ever official until you have that official offer letter with writing and all of the outlined um, negotiation pieces in there that you have been talking about so that you make sure that you have that. And most of the time, um, you shouldn't have to go back to the writing. However, if it just so happens that your 
um, hiring manager that originally hired you leaves the position, gets a promotion, leaves the company, you want to make sure that you have that in writing for the next person so that you can say, well, I've had conversations with this person. This is what was agreed upon. So it's really taking care of yourself and making sure that you are able to advocate for yourself in the future. And then if you need any of that example language for either accepting or declining, um, then we have just a quick example here at the bottom. So if you're accepting um, a role, then some language that you might be able to use is thank you for offering me the position of this. I'm delighted to accept your offer of this and use the language from the negotiation in that acceptance so that you're very clear. I'm delighted to accept your offer of $65,000 a year along with a um, benefits package that includes um, pet health care and um, a stipend for my move and transition of $2,000. So be very specific and name the language that you have negotiated for um, that is different from the original offer. And then likewise, if you're having to decline, if they're unable to meet your needs and expectations for what um, you would be doing in that position, thank you for the offer of this position. It was a pleasure to meet with you and I sincerely appreciate you taking time to consider my candidacy. However, after much thought, I've decided to take another opportunity where I've decided that I cannot accept this offer at this time. I hope we have an opportunity to connect again. Um, again, coming from gratitude, um, acknowledging that they've taken the time to talk with you and walk through this process with you, but in the end, you're unable to accept it. And so, um, good language to use and just good examples for you to practice saying while you are in that practice um, mode with another person. You want to be prepared for both um, scenarios depending on where that offer and negotiation process goes. And if you have any other questions about the negotiation process or about the um, process of finding what is the acceptable salary, um, what can I negotiate for, that kind of stuff, again, or even just needing a practice partner. You can connect with career services um, at any time, make an appointment, set up an appointment and navigate, or you can call the main line, then you can connect with career services to start that process and start getting some practice so that you're prepared for these conversations. So thank you very much. Our email is just here on the slide for services at ccaurora.edu. And again, you can schedule that online or you can also call in to the Career Services Office at 303-360-4929. Thanks everyone. That was great information that <clears throat> Erica provided. Eileen, is there anything that you wanna add or does anyone ask any more questions for Eileen? There's nothing that I want to add to it. I think that she covered it rather completely and how important it is just to be prepared. Exactly. I have a question. How soon, um, right before we graduate, should we like get an appointment with you guys just to go over our resume and things like that? Okay, you should be get. Uh, everyone should have a resume and they should have a resume as soon as they can possibly have one. Uh, you can come and see us at any time. If you would like to make an appointment, you can do so through Navigate or if you're an, uh, an employee, you can certainly come to see us also. Uh, contact us via email uh, with three dates and times that you're available. But there is, like you should have a resume at the beginning of your school. And then if you come and see either Tawana or I about it, we can help teach you how to update it all the way along the line so that you're not throwing something together at the last minute. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes, to me, thank you. Yep.
Anyone else have any other questions? Well, that was really great information. And up on the screen, of course, is the email for career services, as well as financial aid. So if you have questions for either one of us, there's our information or just drop in and see us. So I thank um, everyone for attending, especially Career Services for helping me with this today and enjoy the rest of your day and hope to see you tomorrow in tomorrow's events. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone.